All right. So again, make sure that you go to unit one, click on work, and then by September 15th, um, you should already have the inquiry done, but get all the rest of them done. Your grade will be on the completion of it. Um, you'll have a completion and an accuracy grade. Your grade will be on the completion percent. So Larry Bird hasn't quite finished the inquiry yet. All right. <clears throat> Let me stop and get out of that. Um, and like I said, if you, if you just kind of do one a day, you can kind of stand at a pretty easy pace. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is the reading. So let me share a different tab now. <clears throat> and hopefully uh, my voice feels like it's starting to loosen up a little bit now. Um, so <clears throat> I'll loose you back in. Um, one thing that I want to mention about the reading is how we condense everything down. So um, actually, let me show you another picture here to kind of help you understand why. I forgot I should show you this first. <clears throat> so um, when we study the motion of objects especially, Many objects, like a giraffe, have lots of moving parts. So if we were talking or observing this giraffe moving through a zoo or something, um, if we had the giraffe sort of constructed on some kind of a grid frame, we could talk about the movement, but the giraffe is so big and has so many moving parts. Part of the giraffe's in quadrant one, parts in quadrant two, parts in quadrant three. So are we talking about how the head's moving? Are we talking about how the tail's moving? Are we talking about the center of the giraffe, the feet? And so in, in physics, typically speaking, with movement, we don't really need to worry about all the various parts of the giraffes. We want to kind of condense it down. So if we condense it down, then now, okay, now the whole giraffe's in the third quadrant. And so it makes a little more sense to analyze it. But still, the head is a little higher than the middle, and the middle's a little higher than the feet. So, and as the tail wagging, there's, it's still not quite as simple. So we can narrow it down even further, make it even smaller. And now at least it's now all mostly around that one point, but still the feet are right there at negative one, two, three, four, five, I think, or negative four on the uh, y-axis. But the head's almost at negative three, so it's still not quite simplified to where it's all together. But if we narrow it down further, keep zooming out, zooming out, zooming out, now the giraffe is basically just a dot. And so we don't, we don't even see the head or the tail or the feet or the hooves or anything. We just see a dot. And the reason we do that is in physics, it's a constant balancing act of trying to figure out how we can abstract away what's not important and just focus on what is. So a lot of times in this class, we'll say, well, let's ignore air resistance because <clears throat> a lot of the times while it's realistic, it's not that critical. It's such a minimal impact that we just can ignore it. A lot of times we'll also say, well, let's ignore friction or we'll say it's on a frictionless surface, which that's doesn't exist. There is no frictionless surface. So, uh, but we say that sometimes just to sort of abstract it away because we can get something pretty close, reasonably close. And so we can ignore it to some degree. And so this is something I actually saw on a physics teacher's shirt once. Um, and it says biology to a physicist. And so if you saw a picture of a bird in a biology class, it would label all the different parts, the tail and the wings and the claws and the beak and the eye, and it'd have all these special fancy terms for all the different parts. Uh, but for a physicist, it's just a bird. In fact, it's not just a bird. The bird's just going to be a dot. We're not going to draw the bird. We're just going to draw a dot and say the dot is the bird. Uh, because with motion, we just want to know the whole object. We don't, we don't really care what are the wings doing, what's the tail doing. We just want to know the bird as a whole. So we, we make it a particle. We minimize it all down to a particle. Now, there are branches of physics where we might need to study the aerodynamics of the bird, and then we need to know more about the, the wings. But <clears throat> for what we're doing right now, talking about mo motion in general, we're going to abstract it down to a particle. All right. So that is kind of the why. Now let's uh, highlight a couple things hopefully you picked up on from the reading. 
So that's why when you start reading this document, it shows cars and then they change the cars to dots because we don't really care about the wheels and the trunk and the passengers and all that. We're, it's okay to just narrow that all down and say the car is now a dot. And so that's why they're taking these pictures of cars and converting the cars into dots and then these cars and converting it into dots. The dot is enough. That's all we need to know about the car. So we just simplify it. We abstract everything else away. And then the arrows just tell us which direction the car is moving. And the bigger the arrow, the faster it's moving. The smaller the arrow, the slower it's moving. And then eventually we get to the point then where we can create maps with just dots and arrows like they show you here at the bottom of the first page for that reading. So um, <clears throat> in this picture, we can see a few key things. Here is the start point. And then uh, someone unmute and tell me what, what's happening just in this first row of arrows. What, what's this row of arrows telling me about this object based on what you read? Direction. Telling me the direction. So describe what's happening here. What, what's this object doing? Uh, move. It first moves from, from the uh, left to right and then move back. Good. Good. And so in this first spot, first part, it's just moving left to right. And in these first few seconds, it's just moving all at the same pace. And then eventually it turns around and it's going back the other way. Um, what, why are some of these arrows, somebody else, uh, why do some of these arrows not have, or sorry, some of these dots not have arrows on them? What's, what's going on with that? Because it's holding the same place. It's stopping and remaining in the same spot. Good. So we've got the zero meters and we've got the positive over here showing that this is considered the positive direction. So like Nan said, when it's moving left to right, that's the positive direction. And then here it's just pausing. It's not actually changing position. Its position is staying set. And then um, somebody else, why are the arrows different in this bottom part? What does it mean? It's moving in the direction of the arrow, but slower than the um, initial like movement. Good, good. So the arrow shows it's going the opposite direction, and Nan mentioned that as well. Um, but then also the arrows are smaller, so it's moving at a slower rate. All right, so those are all some good details. Now I'm going to give you a couple things that aren't specifically in this reading that you may want to either jot in the margin or just uh, absorb into your brain something. There's a couple things about these dots that sometimes students get confused on because the dots actually represent multiple things. So one is the dots tell us position. So like this first dot tells us the starting position is not at the zero meter mark, it's somewhere in front of that. And then this dot shows us that one second later, it's at this position, even further from the zero meter mark. And then here it's even further, and here it's even further. But then it starts going back towards the zero meter mark. So here it's getting closer. So the dot does tell you position. And so you need some sort of a scale, generally, to show at least where is the start and which direction are we considering positive. So here it shows you this is the zero meter. That's sort of like the start line, even though it's not where the object started. It's kind of like our baseline. And then this positive sign over here tells us we're considering the positive direction left to right. And so down here, we would consider that a negative direction going right to left. <clears throat> so the dots show you position. And that's probably pretty intuitive from what you read. But the second thing is, and this I don't think is as clear in the reading, the dot represents a, an instant in time, right? So this dot, at the start, that's zero seconds instant. The instant we're at zero seconds, no time has passed. This dot means we're at the instant of one second. So the space between them is the time passing, but the dot itself is an instant. Okay, so this dot, the third dot, is the instant where it was at two seconds. The space between these is the passing of time from one second to two seconds. All right, so just want to make sure you know that the dots are instantaneous points in time. Um, so they tell you the position, but they also tell you the instantaneous points in time. And some students, when they look at motion maps, it very logically and intuitively makes sense to them. And other students look at these motion maps and feel a bit confused and have a hard time interpreting them. One, if you are in that second category where it's a little confusing, 
one thing that I found helps a lot of students, and it even helps me sometimes to do this, write a zero by the dot that's where it says start or begin. Just put a zero beside it because that's zero seconds exactly. And then by the next dot, put a one. And by the next dot, put a two. And the next dot, put a three. And you just actually number the dots because that's like a timestamp. And if you can see the timestamps, a lot of times it makes it a little clearer. So it's not by any means required to write those by the dots, but generally speaking, it can often help you figure out um, what time it is and what the time frames are. So just a suggestion there for you. So a couple things that I, I felt like were sort of described in the reading, but maybe not as thoroughly as I'd like to mention. Um, and then down here, it starts looking at what, here we've got two objects at once, object A and object B. And we can look at it with a motion map. We can also look at it with a graph. We can even make an algebraic mathematical model for it. Uh, so quickly, are there any questions about how we come up with these models from the graph? Everybody okay with that? Can you just like read what the each thing is? like? Just read the equation because I'm just not. It's, it's that like philosophy the, of a. Describe it. Is that what you mean? Like uh, to explain what each letter represents? Yeah. Okay. So, um, in this case, they're not using y equals mx plus b. They're substituting in what the variables are, and this is one thing that often is confusing. They've got an x up here. That x does not mean uh, that this is now the x-axis. What that means is uh, x we often use for position. So what we're saying is uh, the y-axis now is measuring the x variable, which is for position. And so this x is the y variable, but x stands for position. Okay, so that might help. And then va is the velocity of object a, so that's the slope. And then T is what's on the X axis. In this case, the X axis is time. So it's in Y equals MX plus B form, but they're changing the Y to be not the X axis, but to be X meaning position, which is often trips people up. And so this X sub zero here means it's the Y intercept, which is X for position <laughs> uh, at zero time. That's what that little subscript's telling. Does that help? Is that what you're asking? Yep. Okay, sure. So in the second one, uh, X is the position. That's our Y variable. The velocity of B would be the slope of the line for object B. T is time, the X variable. And then they've just left off the, B, uh, the Y intercept because uh, object B passes through the origin. So they just left off the intercept. Anything else about the graphs or equations? I think the most confusing thing is that they put an X there. And so a lot of students are, why are they flip making that the X axis? But it's X for position. Since there is no letter X in the word position, obviously that's the variable we should use. <laughs> uh, usually you would think, why don't they use P or something else? But uh, a lot of times the objects we're talking about do move in the X plane. And so I think that's why they use the variable X for position, even though we often graph it on the Y axis. So that is a little bit confusing. <clears throat> All right. On the hints, I'm not going to read them, but there's two things. Uh, one thing I want to mention for point one and one thing I want to mention for point two. Uh, for point one, it talks about how you can change the scale. So normally we say every dot represents one second. But if you needed to do an analysis for 60 seconds, that means you would have to draw 61 dots because your, your first dot is time zero, and then you'd have to draw 60 more dots after that to get your 60 seconds. Um, and no one wants to draw 60 dots and 60 arrows. That's just a lot of drawing. And so if the object isn't changing direction a lot, you could say like, well, let's make each dot be six seconds. So now I only have to draw 11 dots, a zero plus 10 more. Um, and every dot would be six, it would be six, 12, 18, 24, and on and on. Um, uh, so you can change the scale, but if you do change the scale, you must indicate that. You can't just change the scale, not say anything about it. Uh, so if you don't change the scale, the assumption is every dot is a second. 
And so if you change the scale and don't indicate that, then that you would not get full credit. You have to indicate it if you've changed the scale. If, if you're using the normal every dot's one second, I would suggest you still write it just for clarity's sake, but it's often left off because it's assumed if it's not told otherwise, every dot is a second. Uh, for the second hint there, I would tweak this a little bit. It says make every arrow half the way between the dots, and that's fine. Uh, the key though for me is, whether you want to make them half the distance or the full distance, some students just really hate making them halfway. They just want to make it go dot to dot. And really, that's fine. Uh, the key is be consistent. Because what we're trying to do is make them scaled. So if you make them all half the way between the dots and the dots are changing distances, then your arrows change size. And so you can visually see the velocity changing as the arrows change size. If you make some of them halfway and some of them all the way, then there's no scale consistently through the problem and it's just a mess. So if you want to do like it's suggesting and make them halfway, that's great. If you would rather just make them all the way dot to dot, that's fine too. Just don't mix and match. Uh, whatever you do, keep it consistent so your scale stays the same throughout the problem. And that's all I needed to mention from the reading from my side of things. But did you have any other questions as you read it that you want to ask about? <clears throat> All right, I don't hear any questions, so I'm assuming you're all good to go. So now we're going to open up worksheet one. So um, this is found in Axis under Topics. It is in Unit 2. And uh, we're going to kind of get started a little bit on number one. We're going to discuss it just a bit, make sure you understand the expectation. And then once we kind of get the ball rolling a little bit, uh, I'll put you in breakout rooms for about 20 or so minutes and have you try to get as much of it done together as you can. And then uh, after that 20 or so minutes, we'll come back together and we'll check what you have finished. Uh, we might even have time to check the whole thing. We'll see. Um, and then it's your assignment. Whatever we don't finish will just be your assignment. All right. Um, and hopefully we'll finish it all. In my other classes, we finished it all, but uh, they had time on Wednesday to do that whole positive physics thing. So there, uh, we may not quite get all the way through, we'll see. So in worksheet one, uh, hopefully when you find it, it's in, again, unit two uh, on under topics on Axis. Um, as always for the assignments, if you choose to print it and handwrite your answer, that's fine. If you'd rather open it as a document and edit it, that's fine. Uh, but what we're doing in this worksheet, especially on the first page, is we are either looking at a graph and turning that into a motion map with dots and arrows, and then we're also describing it in words, or they give us the motion map, like number two, if we scroll down here. In number two, they give us the motion map with the dots and the arrows, and they ask us to graph it and then describe it in words. Okay, so we're just asking you to kind of do both directions, from the map to a graph and from a graph to the map. All right, we'll start with number one and kind of talk this through. Uh, we won't draw the map together. I want you to do that with your uh, breakout room group partners, but I do wanna just talk through interpreting this first one together to make sure it's clear how, how this fits. And then I wanna give you four pointers for your descriptions. So uh, let me go ahead and give you the four pointers for the descriptions. So if, if I'm grading your written description, I'm looking for four things, all right? I'm gonna be looking for, first, did you describe the position? So you may wanna jot these four things down in the margin or in your notes or something. These are the four things I would be looking for when I grade a written description. Uh, did you give the position? It doesn't have to be the first thing, but it needs to be one of the four things. Did you describe the position? Another thing you need to include is the direction. So did you describe the direction it's moving? Forward, backward, upside, uh, up, down. So position and direction are two of the four things you need to make sure you include. A third thing that you need to make sure you include is the time frame. How long was it in this position or moving in that direction? Was it for two seconds? Was it for four seconds? Was it for a day? So you need position, direction, time frame. And then the fourth one is rate. How fast or how slow? 
So position, direction, time frame, and rate. And if you know the change in position and you know the time frame, change in position divided by time is the rate. Okay, so two of the four help you find the fourth one. <laughs> and so you need to include all four in a good written description. <clears throat> so I'm gonna ask for some voluntolds here. Uh, so uh, Josiah, let's have you start. Um, and if, if any of you get called on and, and you get confused or make a mistake, don't worry about it, this is our first time. This is just, a, I just wanna get a feel for how you're feeling with this or how you're processing this. So Josiah, let's have you start. Uh, on this graph for number one, um, tell me what you think is happening from time zero to time two. Uh, the object's moving like to the right or up. Okay. Direction. All right. Anything else that you would recognize from that? If not, it's okay. I'm just, I don't want to cut you off. Uh, the speed is constant. Okay, good. Yeah, this, it's a straight line, so the speed's constant. Good. Anybody else see anything uh, you could add to that? That's really good. What he's given us is good, but anything you would add or could add? The rate looks like me, like two meters per second. Okay. Yeah, so he said it's constant, and you can actually find the value. How did you get that value, Hannah? I took the change in Y over change in X. All right. But you said it was in meters per second, so you converted it to the units of the axes, right? Yeah. All right, good. Uh, let's see. Um, Bella, how about uh, from two seconds, or time two to time three, what's going on there? Um, the position is remaining constant. Like it's good. not moving, it's paused. Good. Good, so there's no movement, no rate, but we know the position and we know for how long it's in that position. And so the rate's zero, good. Uh, let's see, uh, Sophia, how about from time three to time seven, how would you describe that movement? Um, it's getting closer again, it's moving back at a rate of one meter per second. Okay, good. So, yeah, you've talked about the rate, you've talked about the time frame, you've talked about um, the direction, really good. So those are the kinds of things we're wanting you to make sure you include in your explanation. So you guys interpreted it quite well, um, but you could start like, uh, the object starts at the zero meter mark, it moves to the right at two meters per second for two seconds. And then it remains at the four meter position for one second and has zero a rate or it's not moving it's motionless something like that and then starting at the third second it moves from the more four meter mark back to the zero meter mark at a rate of one meter per second so again you're telling how its position's changing how long that's happening for and then interpreting the rate all right so that's what i'm looking for in those written descriptions obviously it's not gonna i'm not looking for a word for word explanation i'm looking for did you include the four things the position, the di direction, the time frame, and the rate. Okay, questions about how to do that? All right, so I'll let you work with your groups to see if you can figure out how to make the motion map. Just as a hint, some students actually prefer to start with number two to see if they can figure out this motion map and graph it, and then go back to number one, because just starting with a motion map when you've never made one before, sometimes can be a little intimidating or a little confusing. If you have a motion map given and then graph it, then going backwards sometimes is easier. But you can decide in your groups. Do you wanna start with number one, start with number two. After you finish one and two though, keep moving. Go on to number three. On number three, they've got two objects moving and they ask you a bunch of questions about it. Okay, so you're just gonna answer those questions. And then down here at letter F, it says draw a motion map for cyclists A and B. Now it says a motion map, but what it means is draw a motion map for A, and then separately draw a motion map for B. Okay, you can't have one motion map for two objects. So you have to have two motion maps. You can just draw like one above the line and one below the line for object A and object B. And then on the last page, there's two graphs, but it's this one here is the previous page. 
I just added it again, copied it in, so you didn't have to keep flipping the pages to compare them. So they're just side by side because it asks you to compare what was going on on the first page or the previous page. And then now this is the scenario. And so um, you're going to be doing some comparisons there with that. <clears throat> um, so Layla, that's good. All right. Um, and then same thing down here, motion maps for A and for B. Any questions on how to do the worksheet? All right, it's about five till one. We get out, is it 140, is that right? All right, we'll give you about 20 to 25 minutes, put you in breakout rooms to work on this together. Um, I'm gonna be in pretty small groups uh, so that you uh, aren't having a lot of people to try to manage. <laughs> uh, so you'll have no more than three in your group. All right, here we go. All right, I think everybody's back in the main room now. <clears throat> and I want to go through uh, as much as we have time for. We've got about eight minutes, so we'll at least get through a couple pages. Or no, it's, uh, yeah, 140. Is that when we end? I keep forgetting. Let me check here. Yeah. So we'll get through as much as we can here in the next eight minutes, um, just to make sure you're on the right track. I think we'll be able, probably be able to get to the first and second page. All right, so let me share the key. Hopefully you can see it clearly. Uh, so for the first one, we kind of talked through the description already. So just want to make sure you can look at the map and see that this makes sense. On the map, I'm basically looking for, did you show me where it starts, the beginning point? You can call it t equals zero or start or begin, just some way I know that where you're starting. You don't necessarily have to have the Vs above all the arrow. It's just showing that it's a velocity vector, not some other kind of vector. Um, as we, right now, that's the only kind we're using. So you don't necessarily have to write it over every arrow like it shows here. I just use copy and paste a lot. You should have um, two arrows going to the right and then a dot with no arrow. And then one, two, three, four arrows going to the left. This one at the end, you could have it as just a dot or an arrow. Uh, we don't really know. All we know is what's happening from time zero to time seven. We don't really know what's gonna happen after time seven. It could keep going or it might stop, it's unclear. So you could have an arrow on here or not for the last dot at your ending position. So any questions about number one? Everybody coming up with something pretty similar, hopefully. All right. So there's no point at eight. It's just the arrow. Say that again. There's no point at eight. At eight. Oh, at eight uh, I guess you, you might think that it went flat there. Um, my oh. interpretation was is that it went from three seconds to seven seconds, and that's all we knew. I guess if you thought it went here and then it was flat, since it's all black ink, I guess you can't really tell. If you thought that was flat, uh, then you might say there shouldn't be a dot on there, or sorry, it shouldn't be an arrow. Um, I guess it depends. I just assumed that the line ended at seven seconds. Okay. Yeah. Um, is it, should we say right and left for the directions or could we also say forward and backward? Either way is fine. Okay. Yeah, since they aren't indicating it really clearly, I mean, you could even say up and down, but generally I just use forward and backward, but right and left is fine too. Okay. We generally call forward and right and up as our positive directions and backward and left and down as our negative directions. Do we get marked down if we don't put the, the Vs? No, um, eventually we're gonna have both Vs and As for velocities and accelerations. So then you'll need to label them at least one on each, gra each map oh, okay. so I know which is which. For now, we're only working with velocities, so it's okay if you label them or not. Okay. All right, here's number two. So uh, it already gives you the maps. So your graph should look like this, going down from five meters to two meters in a three second time frame at one meter per second. 
and then motionless from three seconds to five seconds while sitting at the two meter position. And then going backwards again from the five second mark to the seven second mark at one meter per second, ending at the zero position. And then uh, rest at rest or motionless from seven seconds to nine seconds at the zero mark. And then moving forward from nine seconds to 11 seconds uh, at a rate of two meters per second, ending up at the four meter mark. Now we don't know if it stops there at 11 seconds or not. So on this map over here, they do have an arrow on the end dot, kind of implying it keeps moving, but we don't really know that for sure um, in terms of graphing. The graph stops at 11 seconds, so you don't really need to describe it beyond the 11 seconds either. If you did, it's okay, but you just don't have to. Any questions on number two? Is that looking like what you guys came up with? Anybody having trouble with any of it or having a, um, have a question about either the written description or the graph? Again, the written description isn't, I'm not looking for a word for word. I'm, did you describe accurately where it was position? Did you describe which direction it was going forward, backward, right, left, something like that? Did you talk about the rate that it was moving and what the time frames of each segment were? All right, if we move on to the third page, we'll see if we can finish this up here in just a couple minutes. <clears throat> Consider the position of time graph for cyclists A and B. Uh, part A says, do the cyclists start at the same point? How do you know, if not, which is ahead? Um, well, what graphically speaking, what's sort of the math vocab word that describes their starting position graphically? They have different y-intercepts. Right. So their y-intercepts are different, and in this case, the y-axis is x, but it is still the y-intercept because it's still the y-axis. So uh, b starts at a positive value on the y. We don't know what the value is, but it's something positive. A starts at zero. So b has a head start. They don't start at the same spot. At seven seconds, which cyclist is ahead, and how do you know? Well, if we know this is five seconds, seven has to be over here somewhere. We could try to scale it and maybe say it's something like this. But that means B, if we go back, is about at that position. And A, if we go back, is at a higher or further position. So we can just graphically visualize that seven seconds, uh, object A or cyclist A would be ahead of cyclist B. Uh, part C, which cyclist is traveling faster at three seconds and how do you know? Someone unmute and tell us, what did you come up with for C? How do we know that? Cyclist A because the slope is greater. Excellent. The slope tells us the speed or the velocity. Um, we're going to talk about a distinction between those two words later. So some of you may already know, and that's fine. But for now, we haven't really covered it yet. So uh, the slope is greater for A, so therefore the rate is greater. All right, and then D, are their velocities equal at any time? And how do you know? Somebody else. I think for D. Uh, no, the velocities were never equal because their uh, cyclist A always has a, like a higher slope than cyclist B. Great. Yeah, their slopes are never the same, so their velocities are never the same. How about E? What's happening at the intersection of the lines? They may, they may each other. Yeah, they're at the same position, so uh, they might be meeting each other. Hopefully they don't crash. Uh, but they're at least the same distance from the start line. They aren't the same distance from where they, they each began individually, but they are in the same position relative to the start line. So they are meeting each other. Are they moving the same speed at that point? Nope, they're just in the same place, or at least close. All right, and then F, draw the motion map. So I'd be looking for, did you show me where you're beginning? So A began at zero, B began somewhere to the right of zero. Don't really know exactly where, but should be somewhere to the right. Um, they both should be moving to the right or forward. So all your arrows for both A and B should be pointing in the same direction. The arrows for A should be longer because it's moving faster. Its slope was larger. The arrows for B should be smaller because it's moving slower. And then the, the fifth second, which is actually the sixth dot, because remember the first dot zero. So there's zero seconds, one, two, three, four, five. 
the fifth second dots for each one, those two should line up. So the sixth dot or the fifth second of A should line up which, with the same dot for B because that's where they're crossing. That's where they're in the same position like Nan said. All right. Any questions about that? We don't have time to go on to the last page for now, so that'll be your assignment. It's not due until the night after we meet, so if you have some last-minute questions Wednesday, um, you'll be able to ask them for that final page and get those checked before it has to be submitted. So anything you want to ask before we go? All right. Hope you guys have a great Labor Day weekend. Enjoy your extra day off on Monday. If you do have a quick question you want to ask, you're welcome to stay on for a few minutes, but otherwise you are dismissed. Thank you, Mr. Wood. Thank See you, you guys. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you.